Every gamer has a blind spot. Every gamer has at least one game or game series that everybody loves, but they themselves have never touched. Maybe you've heard how awesome the story in the first Bioshock is, but just never got around to experiencing it. Maybe you're one of the, like, 10 gamers on planet Earth who has never played a Grand Theft Auto game. I myself am not exempt from this rule. Up until last year, my blind spot was the Legend of Zelda series. Aside from playing Ocarina of Time for one hour about a decade ago, I had never gotten close to a Zelda game. And it's not because I didn't want to. I imagine with most gamers' blind spots, the excuse they give is that they just never got around to it. With so many games and franchises to enjoy, even the most hardcore gamer is going to miss out on at least one seminal title or series. And mine just happened to be Zelda. Thankfully, my YouTube channel finally gave the excuse I needed to stop messing around and play a Zelda game. About a year ago, I put out a community post asking people if I were to do an analysis of a Zelda game, which one should I do? And by far the one that got the most recommendation was Majora's Mask. No, I didn't skip Ocarina and go right to Majora's Mask. Chillax. I played Ocarina last year, shortly after I made that post, okay? No need to curse me to an eternity in the Water Temple. After finally completing Majora's Mask about a week ago, I can understand why it received the most enthusiastic recommendation. It's because my regular viewers probably felt it would be the best fit for my style of analysis. In case you're new to my channel, what I like to do with my videos is determine what real-life concepts inspired video game developers in the creation of their worlds, in the hopes that I might explain unsolved mysteries or uncover secrets. The most popular subject, for whatever reason, is the inclusion of symbols and ideas that stem from esoteric religious traditions. For example, I demonstrate how concepts from the occult and alchemy have inspired the creation of games like Dark Souls and Silent Hill, along with other popular media like Berserk and Full Metal Alchemist. Majora's Mask appeared to be recommended to me, at least partially, because it was couched in the same type of symbolism. However, Unlike the previously mentioned games, which are mostly dominated by Western esoteric ideas and symbols, Majora's Mask borrowed from the Eastern tradition, primarily esoteric Japanese Buddhism. Now granted, this fact has been picked up on by other YouTubers. Most hardcore Zelda fans are probably already aware that the three-day cycle in Majora's Mask can be linked to the Buddhist concept of samsara or that the fierce deity is a reference to a wrathful incarnation of Buddha. Do not worry though, I'm not here to reiterate or plagiarize what other people have said. Instead, I will take and properly credit those ideas, and attempt to elevate their legitimacy with discoveries that I believe are original. With that said, here's why I believe Majora's Mask is one big Buddhist metaphor. I think the best way to set things up is to start with the world of Termina itself and the Buddhist concepts it, as a whole, might symbolize. The one thing we know for certain about Termina, based on the game's manual, is that it exists in a parallel world to Hyrule. Outside of that official source, there is one other piece of information which stems from a source that is considered dubious by the fan community, the Zelda Encyclopedia. This is because the preface says creative liberties were taken with their presentation of the lore, but only where absolutely necessary. Unfortunately, where those liberties were taken is not specified, which complicates one of the book's most controversial claims. Regarding Termina, it states, like the manual does, that it is a parallel world but also that its geography and aesthetic were shaped by the burdens in the heart of Skull Kid and the evil magic inside Majora's Mask. The most controversial claim is that because Termina's existence was tied to Majora's Mask, Termina disappeared soon after Link defeated the Mask, which implies that Termina's existence relied on Majora's magic birthing a world shaped by Skull Kid's emotions. 
I understand why many Zelda fans would not be fond of this, partially because it's evocative of the whole it was all a dream trope. Personally, given my belief that the entire game is permeated by Buddhist ideas and symbolism, it would make perfect sense for Termina to disappear. One of the fundamental Buddhist concepts is that both reality and our sense of self are illusions, brought about by feelings of attachment and desire. Those feelings keep us locked in a cycle of life, death, and rebirth. A cycle known by the previously mentioned name Samsara. Through acts of good karma and the pursuit of enlightenment, one might transcend these emotions and the illusions they produce. The ultimate end goal would be an escape from the cycle of samsara by leaving behind our illusory reality, just as Gautama Buddha did when he achieved enlightenment under the Bodhi Tree. With this in mind, it makes sense for Zelda fans to equate the three-day cycle of the game with the cycle of samsara. While it's not mechanically the same as Samsara, it is a cycle that Link seeks to not only liberate himself from, but Skull Kid as well. More importantly though, it makes sense for Termina to be illusory because its existence and shape were influenced by Skull Kid's attachment to his four friends. When he transcends this attachment at the end, Termina's existence, shaped by both Majora's Mask and Skull Kid's emotions, is no longer necessary. Of course, none of this would have been possible without the efforts of Link, who, through his acts of good karma, brings happiness and subsequent enlightenment to Skull Kid and the denizens of Termina. In this way, Link becomes a Buddha-like figure, and I don't just mean that metaphorically. In a video called The Fierce Deity Unmasked, a fellow YouTuber named Zeltic drew from a forum post made by a ZeldaUniverse.net user named Gamtos, who suggests that at the end of the game, Link literally becomes a Buddha. The primary piece of evidence comes in the form of the Fierce Deity Mask, which can only be gained by collecting all the masks in the game and then handing them over to the Lunar Children at the end. Right before the final fight, you walk over to the Lunar Child wearing Majora's Mask who will then give you the Fierce Deity Mask. Gamtos and Zeltic note that the title Fierce Deity, along with the Japanese name for the mask, Kishin, refers specifically to a type of Buddha in the esoteric Buddhist tradition. In Japanese, they are known as the Wrathful Mio'o. The Mio'o are the fierce incarnations of five Wisdom Buddhas, four of whom guard the four cardinal directions and a fifth who guards the center. These Buddhas take on a wrathful form whenever they encounter beings that would get in the way of people achieving enlightenment. It is thus thematically appropriate for the hero of the game to wear a Kishin mask, because he is going against Skull Kid and Termina's greatest barrier to enlightenment, Majora's Mask, who is sort of like an avatar for bad karma. Now I will get to the obvious potential connection between the Buddhas of the Four Cardinal Directions and the Four Giants of Termina, but before I do that, I need to address why I believe the Fierce Deity Mask resembles Link. It seems to me that masks, be they in Majora's Mask, or Ocarina of Time, or real life, represent a desire to inherit a positive quality that you don't currently possess. In Ocarina of Time, all the masks represent this desire, with the exception of the Mask of Truth, which actually grants you an ability. When you give the Skull Mask to the Skull Kid in Ocarina, he takes it because he wants to appear stronger. With the masks in Majora's Mask, they actually grant you the quality or ability that you desire. Now a question that Majora's Mask subtly poses and then answers is what mask could contain all possible qualities combined into one? And more importantly, what would it look like? Well, according to a gossip stone in Ikana Canyon, that would be the Fierce Deity Mask because it, quote, contains the merits of all masks. As for why it looks like Link, well, one does not need a mask to hide their true identity if one possesses every quality you can possibly achieve. 
you can appear exactly as yourself, or in Link's case, the ultimate ideal version of himself. This all sort of reminds me of the Hindu religious concept of Atman Brahman. Brahman is the highest goal of Hinduism. It is ultimate reality. Atman is an individual person who is considered an imperfect microcosm of Brahman. The whole goal of Atman Brahman is to bring yourself to a point of development where Atman, you, and Brahman, the ultimate, are the same thing and can't be distinguished from one another. In Link's case, he is the Atman, and the fierce deity is the Brahman. By wearing the metaphorical mask of Brahman, Link's Atman becomes Brahman. Now there is a reason why I am bringing Hinduism into all of this. Follow me here. In Zeltic's video, he makes a connection between Link and the center Buddha of the five Mio'o, Fudo Mio'o. Fudo is the wrathful incarnation of the highest Buddha in Japanese esoteric Buddhism, who is known in Japanese as Dainichi and Sanskrit as Vairokana. According to a Japanese Buddhist monk named Doan, Vairokana is the Dharmakaya Buddha, and Dharmakaya is the Buddhist term for the ultimate reality, the one Buddha reaches upon achieving enlightenment. Though they are slightly different in detail, both Brahman and Dharmakaya, which is personified by the highest Buddha, represent ultimate reality, the ultimate goal in Hinduism and Buddhism. By wearing the mask of the fierce deity, Link becomes indistinguishable from Brahman, from Buddha. He becomes the ultimate version of himself. Now if you thought that was mind-blowing, there's a whole lot more where that came from. Let's get to the Four Giants. As I hinted at before, and as Zeltic suggests in his video, the Four Giants guard the four cardinal directions just like four of the five Mio'o. There's one extra piece of evidence that supports this interpretation that Zeltic and Gamtos didn't include, which also led me to some other discoveries which I believe might be new. After watching Zeltic's video, I started looking into the history of the five Mio'o, and found out that they are also represented by a particular color. Colors that all show up together a couple of times in Majora's Mask. As I said before, the five Mio'o are the wrathful forms of what are known as the five wisdom Buddhas, which in Japanese are known as Nyorai. From what I understand, these five Nyorai are an evolution of an older set of Hindu deities known as the Four Heavenly Kings, also known as the Lokapala, who also exist in the Buddhist tradition as the Shiteno in Japanese. When doing research on the Lokapala, I encountered their depiction in another video game series called Shin Megami Tensei. Notice the colors of the Four Lokapala here yellow, green, blue, and red. I then researched if these same colors represent the five Nyorai that evolved out of the four Lokapala. And as I showed before, the four cardinal deities also represented these four colors, with the fifth one representing white. Now as I said before, we see these five colors represented in a couple of places in Majora's Mask. One is in the final boss room, where we see the four masks placed over what appeared to be Buddhist mandalas, designs which are meant to aid meditators on their path to enlightenment, and which also feature the number four as a theme in its aesthetic. Note the four petals in the center. These mandalas are colored yellow, green, blue, and red. The one that Majora's Mask is covering in the center is white. The same color scheme can also be found in the Goron Trial leading up to the final boss fight, in the place where you find a piece of heart. On this platform, the same five color scheme is represented. Before I move on to the last section of this video, I need to note one last piece of esoteric symbolism related to the four giants. This one is going to make regular viewers of my channel laugh. 
When I found out that I had to reunite the four giants to save the world from the moon crashing, my tendency to look at things through an esoteric lens made me think that this might be a reference to the union of the four classical elements in alchemy. By uniting earth, wind, fire, and water, the alchemist produces the life-giving substance in the form of the Philosopher's Stone. After I watched Zeltic's video though, I abandoned that theory temporarily, to the delight of all those commenters telling me that not everything in the world has to do with alchemy. But get this, when researching whether or not the colors of the five Niorai lined up with the four Lokapala, I found out that the cardinal Niorai do actually represent the four classical elements. Granted though, in the Japanese elemental system, there is an extra fifth element that represents space slash void. Now, in Japanese esoteric Buddhism, there is also a union of these elements that produces a sort of immortality, just like unifying the elements in Western alchemy produced the immortality-giving philosopher's stone. Take a look at this statue of Dainichi, the center Buddha of the five Nyorai. His hands are performing what is known in Buddhism as a mudra, which is something that signifies that particular Buddha's function, as well as something that monks use in their spiritual activities. This mudra in Japanese is called kakushuin, which translates to mudra of supreme enlightenment. Note the four fingers and thumb on the right hand grasping the index finger of the left hand. The five digits on the right hand represent the five Japanese elements, and the index finger on the left hand represents the sixth element that unites those other five. That sixth element is mind. It is only when the mind activates the five elements that one achieves supreme enlightenment. With that, I will now close things out with a bit of speculation. I theorize that maybe we see a version of that sixth element in Majora's Mask, in the form of the moon. Think about it. It's the place where we see the five masks, the five colors, and the elements they represent unify. Upon entering the moon, Link enters into a sort of dream-like dimension, dreams of course originating from the mind. In this dream, he sees a single tree on a hill, which I and other Zelda fans have theorized symbolizes the body tree under which the original Buddha achieved enlightenment. The child sitting under the body tree represents both Skull Kid and the center Buddha, while the four children running around the tree represent the four giants and the four cardinal Buddhas. By removing the five masks that corrupt these children, Link allows the five Buddhas and the five elements they represent to be unified within the dreamscape of the moon, representing the sixth element. The result brings enlightenment to both Link and Skull Kid, and allows them to leave the illusion of Termina behind. Finally, I will provide two other smaller tidbits which link the moon to Buddhism. The most important holiday in the Buddhist tradition is Vesak. The day of Vesak is held on the day of the full moon, specifically because it is believed that Buddha's birth, enlightenment, and death all transpired on a day that there was a full moon. Second, the cycle of the moon's phases is linked to the cycle of samsara in Buddhism. The full moon represents birth, the waning towards the new moon represents death, and the waxing towards the full moon represents rebirth. In summary, we see in Majora's Mask two borderline definitive references to immortality in esoteric Buddhism, along with a possible third one stemming from Hinduism, which parts of Buddhism evolved out of. By reuniting the five wisdom Buddhas, which represent the five elements, Link achieves the ultimate goal of supreme enlightenment. He becomes indistinguishable from Buddha, just like the Atman becomes indistinguishable from the Brahman in Hinduism. Upon achieving this state, there are no limits. The only thing that is left, as the fierce deity sword clearly symbolizes, is infinity.
Special thanks to Gaming University for looking over my script and offering his thoughts. And special thanks to Indy for not only doing the same thing, but also crafting the thumbnail art and helping edit a substantial portion of this video. Make sure to hit that like button if you like this video. Also, to all the Zelda fans watching this video, what Zelda game should I tackle next? Let me know in the comment section below. Finally, if you liked this type of in-depth analysis and want to help ensure its continued production, please consider checking out my Patreon page or my YouTube member section. I will leave links to both in the description box below. Thanks guys, and until next time, I want to remind you as always and as per usual, stay yellow.